Right, I think we are live. Yeah, you're live. Fantastic. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is wonderful to be with you uh, for this session, uh, live session of the all party uh, group on coronavirus. Um, we have a very topical session uh, for everyone today um, because we are going to be looking at, first of all, the wider uh, landscape, the epidemiological landscape of the UK um, right now, but we are also going to be deep diving a little bit into an area that this committee has been concerned about for quite some time, which is international travel. Um, in fact, uh, the committee first wrote with recommendations to the Prime Minister back uh, at the beginning of August 2020, um, so nearly a whole year ago now, um, with our concerns that the way they were managing people coming in and out of this country um, and variants of concern and the potential for uh, what we're already beginning to see across the world, um, we hoped that they would start to address it last summer. Um, we're now approaching the next summer along, and it does look like we're about to take the third lap around the track, as I think some of uh, our parliamentarians have been saying this morning. Um, uh, are we destined to repeat the mistakes that we've made before? Um, I hope not, because that's the whole point of this committee. And if not, uh, what should we be looking at and what should we be changing? So I've got um, some fantastic uh uh, panelists with us today. Um, our first panel will take 45 minutes and then we'll go to the second. Um, so let me start by introducing them. Um, we have with us in this first panel uh, Dr Stephen Griffin, who's the Associate Professor in the School of Medicine at the University of Leeds, specialising in viral oncology and antivirals. So welcome Stephen, thank you for being with us. Um, we also have Professor Dinan Pillai, um, Professor of Virology at the University College London, and a member of Independent Sage. You're very, very welcome. We have Professor John Deeks, who leads the Biostatistics, Evidence Synthesis and Test Evaluation Research Group at the Institute of Applied Health Research at the University of Birmingham. Welcome. And last but certainly not least for this first panel, we have Professor Lawrence Young, Professor of Molecular Oncology at the University of Warwick. Well, thank you all so much for being with us today. Um, and let's start with a big picture question. And I don't mind who answers this first, uh, wave, wave at the screen. Um, are we expecting a third wave? And if so, when? <laughs> who wants to take that one? Professor Lawrence, do you want to have a go? Well, Deenan's got his hand up. Oh, Deenan, Deenan, yeah, go for it. <laughs> then I'll follow on. Sorry, I was... Uh, uh... But um, so uh, my view is we're clearly, you know, doing a tremendous job in immunization. Um, uh, I think that immunization will um, ha have a very significant impact on at least the degree of hospitalizations, redu reduction hospitalizations um, for the current variant, but possibly for other variants. Um, what What is worrying to me is that there's um, there remains a heterogeneity across the population, both in terms of uh, vaccination uptake, um, but also, of course, um, risk factors for for being exposed to infection and um, and getting disease. And I think it is likely that future waves, rather than being the generalized of a generalized nature that spread around the country may become more localized in areas of disadvantage. Um, and uh, uh, my worry is that it's easy to forget those outbreaks, but they're going to be very um, significant. And, uh, and, uh, and I think the implication of that is, is to continue and enhance uh, capture of all those who need to be immunized, you know, um, being able to uh, convince um, individuals who may be hesitant to be immunized. But, but as well um, put some thought into the importance of ongoing test, trace, isolate, and the ability to isolate for people who are in poverty in order to mitigate against that sort of nature of the third wave. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, and and to, to the others, if you, if you want to come in on this, I mean, I suppose what we're trying to get to here is, you know, what can we expect over the next coming weeks? Is it inevitable that cases are going to rise? 
I think I think we're all expecting, aren't we, that cases will rise as a consequence of the changes in the last few weeks. But I think coming back to Deanan's point, I think there are a couple of things. One is the the issue about how we're managing local outbreaks. I think what we're going to expect to see in the coming months is local outbreaks and stressing the issue around the need to get test, trace and isolate really working effectively, particularly supporting people into isolation is it'll become more of an issue. What we've done with vaccination, what vaccination has done in terms of heavy lifting has, has to, to a certain degree removed the link between cases and hospitalization. And that's the hope that that will continue. But I think superimposed on all of this will be something we'll come back to no doubt is we just can't predict the behavior of these variants and how they're going to impact both on outbreaks on the possibility of reinfection and on the degree to which vaccinations are protective against those variants. Thank you. Stephen, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, well, I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. I think we, we mustn't be complacent and it will take some time for these changes to bed in, particularly the changes that are planned for June. Um, I think, you know, our patterns of behaviour over summer, as we saw last year, will reduce cases down significantly. We, we know this. However, once we start mixing indoors again, um, there is the potential for that to come back. And we also know that this virus can come back from pretty low numbers in very restricted geographical locations, as we saw last year in the north of England, and then later on when the Kent variant emerged. So it really is important to keep those cases down. And it's fair to say that we really haven't got the cases down as much as we did last year yet. So I would, I would favour being cautious, preventing the, the importation of cases in particular, and ensuring, as everyone said here, that the vaccination program is, is, is up to date, fast, and it's really a race. You know, if, if we can get our vaccination coverage sufficient in enough broad range and, and wide range of, of age groups, hopefully we can win that race. But we, we really can't run a straight race against this virus. We need to put everything in its path that we can to slow it down. And that includes maintaining some levels of restrictions, in my view. Thank you. John? I've got nothing to add to that. Thank you so much. Uh, exemplary. Um, Philippa Whitford. Thanks very much, Leila. I'd like to ask uh, Professor Deeks a question and then others can signal if they want to <laughs> add anything to it. Um, we're going to explore the ethical and social issues around the domestic use of vaccine passports in our next session. But I just want to explore the practical issues of various options they're considering other than just the proof of vaccination. So if PCR tests are what is required at the border, should we really be relying on lateral flow tests to allow people into mass events? And should a previous history of COVID on its own be taken as proof of immunity without a recent antibody test? Okay. Um... So the idea of using lateral flow tests or any tests which can only detect a proportion of, of the cases to allow people into mass events inevitably would lead to individuals being into those, getting into those events who have the disease and can spread it. So we only need to go back to um, the Rose Garden White House outbreak where they were using the Abbott ID Now test, which is uh, um, a sort of lateral flow molecular test, perhaps slightly better performing than the one we've got in the UK. And um, we know the story there. I think it was 48 cases, including the president and the first lady uh, were infected. So we have some um, uh, observational experiments which can show you know, cases where that sort of thing happens. So any situation where you're using a test which misses cases, which we know our current lateral flow test does, uh, the only data we have on its use in mass testing as to how it's sensitive it is, is from Liverpool Pilot, where there were 70 COVID cases and it found 28 of them. And of those with high viral loads, it found uh, um, 26 out of 39, so two thirds. So we know it misses important cases and that is gonna be a problem if we use it for these venues. It would be far better to use the best technology possible uh, to make sure we detect those, those cases. So uh, in that issue, that's a problem. And it will occur again with vaccine passports. It's not a going to, um, uh, you know, if we're using that to show that you're free of disease, uh, we know that it will be missing some. And, and that's been the, the key public health message we've been trying to, to get out, that if you're test negative on the lateral flow test, it is an indication that you're safe and don't have COVID. Your risk has reduced, it's possibly halved of having COVID, but it certainly isn't down to zero. So no, it doesn't seem like a good option. Uh, in terms of 
uh, having disease, I guess we're looking at results of studies like SIREN, which have published um, showing how um, the disease rate in people who've had a previous infection has gone down. So that's the study in the healthcare workers. And I think I'm talking from memory here, but it's a, it's a substantial reduction, maybe at 80% or something like that. I think we've got more research to do to understand how well the antibody tests can actually predict that. But that, that you know, I, I think we're looking really at making sure we're reducing risk. So we're looking to uh, make sure everybody has got the lowest risk they can have, but we can't exclude risk with any of these tests or strategies. But are you concerned that it's, you know, if you've had COVID, up to almost six months ago, then and even perhaps quite a mild case, you would be considered immune when actually the, the, there's such a wide range of how long someone's immunity lasts. Um, I think the data aren't there to, to uh, substantiate it. Shortly in the, in the immediate period, yes, but in, in, when you're getting to that length of duration, I think we're in uncertain territories. So I'm, I'm sure others on the panel can give details on that too. Okay, thank you. Does any of our other guests have anything they want to add? Only to come back to the point, I think the point of waning immunity is really important here, actually, because we still don't understand how long protective immunity lasts, either in response to natural infection or indeed vaccination itself. And as John has alluded, I think the data at the moment is probably, is probably you, get, you do get some protection up to eight months after natural infection but it's not the entire population. And this is one of the problems with trying to come up and sort of summarize immunity or infection at the population level. There's so much variability. But the suspicion is looking at what's going on in other parts of the world with reinfections, that actually, you know, the, 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 the levels of antibodies um, don't, don't correlate necessarily very well with that. And that's another big issue for us. We still don't really have good correlates of protection. And, and is that worse with people who had very mild or even asymptomatic COVID but that happened to get diagnosed for some reason. That, exactly. And I think that's, that's, that's a real problem when we start to think about the impact of reinfections. I mean, there's been some reports recently, albeit at low levels from CDC, of fully vaccinated folks getting reinfected. And I think, again, a, a concern on top of that is, is how these variants will behave in a, in a group of individuals with waning immunity. OK, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Yeah, I, I completely agree with all that. And I think as well, we need to remember not to be complacent about the fact that many of us have only had one vaccination, not two. Um, in particular, that's important potentially for the elderly and people with immunocompromised um, scenarios. They may not mount as strong a response to the first dose of vaccine as they might after the second one. Generally speaking, they do make a good response after the, the second one, but we need to make sure that that is our level of protection that we aim towards. And I think there has been a degree of complacency creeping in after people have had their first jab. I think that's something we need to really keep an eye on. And I think all of this as well, including the testing, the passports and everything else, speaks to the fact that we can't just concentrate on one measure in isolation to keep control of this epidemic. We need the best way of mitigating risk is to keep cases low. And if we don't keep cases low, all these other confounding factors will come into play as to whether the, the tests are reliable, whether vaccine um, mediated immunity is long lasting or not. If we keep cases low, if we keep variants out, then that solves the problem without having to even deal with the other things. And obviously it will be September before all adults have both of their doses. So we're a long way from that. Thank you very much, all of you. Back to you, Chair. Thank you so much. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I wanted to sort of follow up with a specific example of what's happening in London right now, because obviously we're seeing areas where the, the, there is mass testing for variants in certain London boroughs. And I wanted to ask you whether you think that will be enough to drive down cases of these variants. Uh, I'm not sure who to go to first, sorry. Um, Professor Lark Young, you're, you're looking at me. Yeah, no, uh, yes. I mean, I think surge testing is interesting, isn't it? In the sense that there are a couple of things. I mean, one is, is the, it's the time it takes after identifying positives to, to get genome sequencing working. We might want to come back to that. I think that's a real issue in terms of the lag. But I think something we've already alluded to, which is so important here, is how are we going to guarantee that we're supporting individuals to isolate? We've seen lots of variable bits of data over the last few months about the proportion of people with symptoms and indeed with positive tests who are isolating. We can only stamp out the spread of the infection 
and of these outbreaks that are going to be inevitable over the coming months if we're support really providing the appropriate support for, for folks to isolate. And I think that's a real issue and something I'd like to certainly hammer home today if we can do anything. Uh, if we could do one thing, I think it would be to provide the appropriate financial support for individuals to isolate. That will stamp out the spread. Thank you. I can see others nodding. Is there any new point to raise? Professor uh, Pillay, thank you. Um, I fully agree with Lawrence and just um, adding something is uh, about the granularity of identifying um, and the time lag between um, a sample being taken and then the genetic characterization being done. Um, and it does seem to me, and let's say that is anywhere between two and four weeks. So we could have a situation where four weeks after um, uh, one of these variants has been identified, um, there's what I think is a bit of a naive assumption that, huh, that, that testing should happen in the postcodes in London around where that was first identified. And uh, I don't know how anyone else, anyone else who lives in a place like London, you know, you, you don't limit yourself to moving within postcodes. So I do think that there's, um, there does need to be a stronger underpinning of being able to much better monitor infections anyway, particularly as infection levels come down. And uh, I'd just reaffirm what Lawrence has said, the essential component of, um, of supporting people to isolate. And in, in fact, you know, incentivizing people to get tested because at this moment in time, asking people to be tested, you know, if I was someone where being tested positive would actually cause so much disruption to my life, the people I live with and work and, and income, then of course there is very little incentive to be tested. Just to explore that a little bit further. So um, the case has been made several times about paying people more to enable them to self-isolate. When you talk about incentives, are you talking about things like, you know, like they do in some other cities around the world where <clears throat> people will come and make sure that you're uh, that you've got food if you need it, um, that, that if necessary, you could move to a, to a, to a hotel if you're in a home of, of multiple occupation, or are you thinking of something more specific than that? That's a, a really interesting um, question, and, and I'll verge into sort of more speculative thinking, but um, given the amount of money that's been put in the reported amount of money into test and trace with the sole purpose to stop or limit transmission, um, and, and we clearly the National Audit Office and others have, have shown that it's been highly ineffective, it almost makes sense to pay people to be tested and to support them to be isolated if we want to reduce transmission. Um, that's an extreme example, but nevertheless, it is, I think if money is going to be used with a purpose of reducing transmission, we've got to be thinking about what is the optimal way to do that. Really interesting, thank you. Did um, Dr. Griffin have anything to add or? Yeah, um, yeah I'd just like to, I mean, the, the mass testing is, is fantastic. It hopefully is enough to break those transmission chains, but I completely fully endorse supporting people to get tests. But a lot of this is, is trying to play catch up. And I think that a major factor in a lot of what we're doing, you know, keeping things under review or, or chasing tests around the country, as Dean Ann said, we, we won't win a straight race with this virus, especially with the lag time that we have. I think we need to prevent um, virus being imported into the country. And I think that it's an absolutely critical point that Dina made about travel. We're a small country, we're densely populated. And I think perhaps the best example of this is where in that first lockdown around Leicester where travel was limited, we really, really crushed cases very quickly. Whereas if you compare that to Greater Manchester last year, clearly not the case. So I think it's really important that we um, can rapidly move to prevent rather than to try and catch up and, and sort of make the best possible solution that we have. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I haven't come to Professor Deeks, but if there's nothing new to add, then I know the chair will probably be happy because we've got many questions to go through. Yes, indeed. I mean, just just uh, if I can ask just a quick follow up of, of Professor of John. Um, mass testing, um, it seems to be the panacea at the moment. There's a, there's a million shortcuts that the government keeps trying to take. And the latest does seem to be mass testing. Um, how reliable is it overall? What, do we have any studies that show that this works? Uh, no, I mean, this is one of the issues we should be looking at is, is where's the evidence 
for these interventions that we're using. I mean, for this mass test that we're using, the Innova test, as I said before, we have the Liverpool study and we have the University of Birmingham study. That's a total of 78 cases where we know how well it detects them. That is absolutely outrageous that we're now testing the whole population based effectively on data from 78 people, which actually showed it doesn't work very well. Um, so yes, it picks up some cases. And if we were testing those cases, we would miss them. So yes, it has got some benefit, but at what cost? Um, I mean, in Southwest at the moment, I think we're down to, uh, from the ONS figures, we're down to 0.09% prevalence. And that probably means that in the Southwest, we'll be using 10,000 tests to find one case uh, in, in, in the next few weeks. Um, I don't think that's a good use of people's time or money or public health capital uh, to do that. There are, there are far better things we could be doing um, going back to the let's fix the test trace and isolate process. That is where we need to be. I think it's, um, we often hear the sound bite from um, the director general of the WHO, which is test, 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 he said last March. But afterwards he said, test every suspected case. If they test positive, isolate them and find out who they've been in contact with two days before they got symptoms and test those people too. We're not doing that. We've never done that. And, and that really is all in one piece of the document he wrote um, we should be doing that rather than spending the money on testing so many people with a test which is going to find a few and risks being misused in many other ways thank you very much barbara keely yeah um go back to the restrictions and the easing of them the prime minister has spoken of the need to be cautious in our easing of restrictions do you believe the current timetable is a sufficiently cautious approach would like to take that. Professor Pillay. I'll start. Um, at the time, I, I did think what was sensible was um, to have this five week separation between major steps to allow there to be a full assessment of the impact of, 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 of that. Um, it is, uh, you know, Against that, of course, is is um, the government making clear, and certainly the prime minister making clear that this op these steps are irreversible. As he said, it, I'm going to be irreversibly drinking a pint of beer in a pub, whatever that means. But uh, but he, you know, so so I think we're on a one way trip here. Um, that's my reading of the of the political environment. But I do think we need to maintain the flexibility to really be able to assess what the impact is, the, the inevitable rise in cases that there will be as we open up, the degree to which vaccination has really reduced um, the potential for hospitalisation and death. Uh, and, and so I think care is, is, is needed, but there needs to be the ability to, um, to, to slow down um, uh, the 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 release of lockdown, if need be. So data, not dates, I think is the right um, phrase. There's a few nodding heads. Does anybody want to add to that? Yeah, Dr. Griffin. Yes, yeah, Stephen. Yeah, I I completely agree with with Dean. And, um, I think we should be including case numbers as part of our consideration as to moving forward through these these standpoints. Um, I think it's particularly concerning some of the changes that we might see in May and then later on in June, uh, where people are allowed to, to make their own choices regarding risk and things like that in terms of the number of people that meet outdoors. I think it's important to emphasise that they're not just determining their own risk, they are potentially determining the risk to others. And so I think that that sort of language can be slightly difficult for people to navigate. I think clear guidance is important. I think leaving people without clear guidance has caused trouble in the past. And, and I think that they need to be clearer about those sorts of points in terms of the number of people mixing and where they can mix. Um, particularly when we start allowing mixing indoors, I think that's really going to be interesting to watch. But again, the problem that we have is that we have to wait to see what happens. And so absolutely, data not dates, completely agree. Yeah, and there's a time lag with that, yeah, thank you. Any other points or shall we move on? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Dean, and, Dean and had his hand up. All oh, right. Yeah. Sorry, very brief. I mean, th there are some real concerns to me about, you know, it, the vaccination programme. 
Um, and and I mentioned earlier about pockets of, you know, of low levels of vaccination. Um, so I know, for instance, that, um, um, you know, NHS data on vaccine uptake amongst healthcare workers in hospitals, that um, in London, um, there are a number of hospitals where the phrase is not, I don't particularly like that BAME staff, only 50% of them have been immunized. These are patient facing um, healthcare workers in hospitals. And whilst that's happening, you know, it's easy to forget that, but it, it you know, these, these are major drivers of, of many, many of the sort of ongoing issues that we had in earlier waves about nosocomial infections in hospitals and so on, particularly amongst disadvantaged. So I, I really do think we need to go slowly as, as others have, 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 have said, and, and in the meantime, really work hard at tightening up some of these gaps that we're seeing. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. So, thank you very much. Um, on a very related matter, uh, Baroness Masham. Um, what do we do about current COVID hotspots, hotspots in, in the UK? And what is driving this? And what do we do if someone does not want to be vaccinated? I have in my household a young man who doesn't want to be vaccinated because he's lost his spleen. Who, who will answer that? Um, so, Dean and I, uh, you, you've had uh, things to say about hotspots. Is there anything more you want to add before I, I give it to other people? Um, I think I've, 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 I've said everything. The, the, the only other thing is, is that um, when, when uh, it's looked, the, the issue about when hesitancy, how to deal with this vaccine hesitancy, and I, I separate vaccine hesitancy from anti-vaxxers, um, uh, but vaccine hesitancy, it does seem that, that it, it may be just a longer period of time that it takes in those individuals to decide to get vaccinated. And over time, there's, so I do think there needs to be patience, but also, of course, the right messaging, the right, engagement with different communities to really uh, keep going with this thank you Does who anyone... should give them who should give them the help and advice uh, well, well I, I, I do think this is a um a, you know this is a government responsibility um the government um is responsible for enacting a policy and of course through the nhs um but of course, that needs to be. Uh, there's enough. There's enough different people advising on how government messages should be portrayed. That I think, um, um, as is happening, is that this needs to be done involving local communities, involving the sort of arguments and countering the sort of arguments that are coming up. You know, that that is contributing to to vaccine hesitancy. But of course, as as um, as as uh, you say. There are clinical reasons as well why people are not being why people are not being immunised, and um, uh, and of course that's a responsibility for all of us to ensure vaccination is as high coverage as possible to protect those individuals indeed who for whatever reason cannot be immunised or will not respond so well to immunisation, such as those who are immunocompromised and so forth. Anyone else, Stephen? Sorry, I just wanted to speak because I live in Leeds and I think it's very noticeable that um, the areas where infections have remained high, despite cases going down across the board, are pretty similar to what they were last year. Um, and we've seen that it can re-emerge from those. Well, of course, we have vaccines now, but I imagine it probably relates back to what we were saying about supporting people before in terms of getting tested and being able to isolate. And I think that's going to be a major factor, particularly in cities particularly in, 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 in more impoverished areas. I think it's critical that resources put into that to tackle infection rates in these areas to stop it coming back again, if, especially if we're having trouble with, with vaccination compliance in, in certain areas. I live in North Yorkshire and, and rural areas are a big problem mm. uh, because they don't have access to so many experts as maybe there are in Leeds. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Lord Strasburger. Good morning. Um, I'd like to ask you about herd immunity. There's been reports um, in the last couple of weeks that the UK has reached herd immunity. Uh, my first question is, is that correct? 
And the other question is what damage does the uh, variance of concern do to the whole concept of herd immunity? Uh, Professor Pilo, would you like to start? I'll, I'll certainly give, give, give that a go. Um, the terminology of herd immunity um, it relates and relate and is widely accepted to say something about the amount of vaccination coverage needed within a population to limit the spread um, um, of, of, of an infection. Um, my view is the term herd immunity has been misused um, um, and, and, and has started to mean different things to different people. Um, but the idea of herd immunity uh, um, that, that was, for instance, um, uh, pushed by the Great Barrington Declaration um, um, some months ago um, was based on the concept that this was a um, an infection which for the vast majority of people had no consequences and therefore fine to get people in, in, infected um, and, and become immune and in so doing create that, um, that s situation that um, I've described before from a vaccination point of view that the infection will no longer spread. Um, I think this is flawed um, for a number of reasons. Um, and we've touched on some of these, for instance, you know, we don't know how long immunity lasts and so on. But also, of course, that this is not a, a mild infection or an asymptomatic infection. We're learning more and more about even in younger people, how there can be uh, very untoward consequences. So that is my view is that the, the, the concept has been flawed. Where, where what's come into the news recently is um, um, reports of modelling for, for undertaken by a colleague of mine uh, um, at University College London, um, who, um, who, 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 whose model demonstrated that, in fact, if we maintain the current level, this was two weeks ago, the, the level of lockdown, that the number of infections um, will remain low as a function of um, the number of people vaccinated, as well as the number of people who would be immune from natural infection. Um, that is a very different, different concept of herd immunity to, I think, what, 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 what many of us would think. Um, and therefore, I think that concept um, uh, does, not, does not support herd immunity being a con uh, generating some control of infection as we release the lockdown. Let me just add to that, and I agree with, with Dean. And I mean, most estimates have placed a threshold of between 60 and 70 percent of the population gaining immunity either through vaccination or past exposure to the virus. But I think reaching a, reaching that threshold is going to be very difficult. Reaching that threshold as a stable threshold, given what we've just discussed, for instance, about the level of vaccine hesitancy, uh, the emergence of new variants, and um, in even the delayed vaccination of children, for instance. So we still have a lot of unknowns here, not least the fact that we don't know whether vaccines are able to really prevent transmission. Most of the uh, vaccines that provide sterilizing immunity uh, block transmission. We're still not sure about the level of that for these different vaccines. And as we mentioned previously, how long vaccine induced immunity lasts. But what we know from other coronaviruses and early data from SARS-CoV-2 is it seems that infection associated immunity does wane our, over time. So I think this, 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 this does make the whole concept of herd immunity as something we should be reaching as a goal that will protect the entire community from, from this, this infection very, very difficult. And, and as I said, and I think I agree with Dean, and it's a, it's a flawed concept, actually. And do, and do variants of concern further undermine it? Absolutely. I mean, the big, the, you know, there's lots of unknowns, obviously. The, one of the concerns, as we, look, as we looked out to South Africa, and indeed, Chile and Brazil is, re is people getting reinfected, and the, the uh, that that's a real issue. The degree to which that's a uh, that's a factor associated with waning immunity and or the changes in these variants is something we still don't know. But it does it does compromise this whole issue of uh, of herd immunity. Any of our other guests? Yes, Stephen. I'm, I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, but um, I think there is also a difference to be made, a, a, something to specify in, in terms of herd immunity, the concept, as to whether you're starting from the introduction of a new infection 
or a pandemic that's 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 ongoing at the moment. And so I agree with with Lawrence that, that it will be difficult to reach that threshold. And of course, the variants will have different numbers of susceptible people with immunity waning and, and what have you. And so that that bit of maths that, that dictates the level of herd immunity that you require is less. But if you get cases as low as possible, even if you haven't reached as high a herd immunity threshold as you want, it will still effectively cut down the number of transmission chains that can occur. And, and that again is a, another reason to maintain pressure on the number of cases as well as ensuring our vaccination is, is high. And I would also advise that we extend our vaccinations to, to school children because, you know, introduce it with our annual vaccines that, that we do every year, because that ensures that there's a pipeline of at least partially immune populations coming through the, the, the pipeline, if you will, that will ensure that we, we hopefully never have the series of, of devastating outbreaks that we've had recently. Professor Dietz, did you, did you want to add anything? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I have a follow up for Professor Deeks, um, which is, can these variants of concern also escape testing? Um, well, they can. Um, I, each one needs to be looked at individually and assessed against the tests as to whether or not it's going to be covered by that test. Um, so some of that can be done by um, uh, the molecular understanding of the variant. Others of it needs empirical evaluation um, and it needs to be looked at quite carefully. I know um, Port and Down are doing this in, in small sets, so it is being considered seriously. Um, I'm not up to date on the exact findings from all of that, but um, it is an issue. Yeah, so coming back to, to questions that we've had before, we've now got a, a, a number of different variants that we are concerned about, some of them variants of concern and some of them variants under investigation. Is it possible that they have different levels of uh, specificity and um what was the other word sensitivity, sensitivity depending on on the test so the end of a test that we're all being asked to do at home the mass testing all the rest of it is it is it the case that actually all the ones that we're concerned about at the moment have the same parameters or is there already differences between them or do we i i don't know the answer to that question i don't know whether others do I don't think anybody does. And I think given the way that the lateral flow tests work, it's very likely that some of these variants will not be detected as sensitively or as specifically, but I guess we just don't have the data. Thank you. Um, and just a very quick follow-up, um, perhaps to, to Lawrence or anyone else. Is what I'm hearing correct, which is that we could vaccinate the vast majority of the adult population in this country and still not get to herd immunity? Is that the thrust of what was being said just now? I think it is. I think I think, I think the, the concept of herd immunity in the context of the, of a new infection, it comes back to Stephen's point, actually, is, 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 a, is a very difficult one in this context. Um, yeah. And I guess I think, again, I think the vast majority of the public are seeing right 50 percent of the country has been vaccinated. Well, 50 percent of the adult population have been offered a vaccine in the first one. And they're equating that with the figure that they're hearing about herd immunity. So the 60, 70 percent figure those are absolutely not, they cannot be read over. So, so, so do we, I mean, in the best case scenario, what proportion of our population do we need to vaccinate to hit the 60, 70%? Presumably it's more than 60, 70% of the population because not everyone gets the same level of immunity. Have I understood that correctly? Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> That's have. quite important. Um, I just say that, that, that you know, the, the idea is for it not to become something that people become complacent about and say we've passed a certain threshold. What we need to do is aspire to get that number as high as possible. And and because, it, you know, a, a mathematical calculation can tell us one thing, but as you rightly said, biological variation means that is uncertain. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, finally, can I go to Lord Russell? Yes, thank you very much. Um, we were, you were talking earlier about the, uh, the test, trace and isolate system and uh, the degree to which it is or it isn't working. Given what we've just been talking about now, which is uh, that herd immunity is, is, is a concept and no more, uh, and, and this isn't going to go away, it sounds as if the test, trace and isolate system will become more important rather than less important. Given your understanding of its functioning at the moment, what needs to change, be as specific as you can, and how. Could I start with you first, Lawrence? 
Yes, I think I think we've obviously discussed at some at some length now the issue of supporting folks into isolation. I think there are a couple of things. I mean, one one thing that worries me, particularly with surge testing, is what qualifies for surge testing. My understanding, and I'm prepared to be corrected by colleagues, is that at the moment we surge test for when we decide that we have a so-called variant of concern not a variant under investigation. So for instance, at the moment, as I, as I understand it, the degree to which we'll be surge testing in theory for the Indian variant will be perhaps not to the same extent as the South African variant. So we need to, we need to get that right. We need to speed up, as Dean has, uh, has highlighted, the, the way that we test. And I understand at the moment the PHE are looking at more specific PCR tests so that we can identify variants very rapidly without having to really having this delay in, um, in sequencing. So I think it's absolutely right that we should be putting much more effort into test, trace and isolate. And as John has alluded to, I agree. I think we're spending an awful amount of um, money and time on lateral flow testing everybody. Wouldn't it be better if that, some of that was redirected to support the test, trace and isolate system? Thank you, Lawrence. John, anything to add over and about that? Yes, several things. First of all, the symptom set has stayed the same for a long time. And there are, uh, there's quite a lot of discussion that the actual symptoms which are associated with coronavirus are quite a lot wider um, and it needs to be um, expanded. I know um, where I am in, in Birmingham, in Dudley and Sandwell, they are expanding the set of, of eligible symptoms. They have seven on a B list, which you can go and get tested with a PCR for, but that's not being, seems to have been considered at a national level. Um, the other issues are times is actually we've not actually improved our times in terms of getting results through. Um, this uh, positive use of lateral flow tests is actually to stick them in test and trace centers and use them as a test alongside PCR. So if an individual got tested at a test and, test and trace center with both PCR and lateral flow, they can wait for the results. They'll get it in 30 minutes. If it's positive, it'll be almost certain that they have the disease. There won't be that many false positives. If it's negative, you'd have to wait for the PCR. But if that was paired up with contact tracers um, actually in the in the test and trace center, the whole process of getting in touch with contacts could be increased by four days. It's 96 hours, I think was the figure at the moment uh, to get in touch with contacts. So, and then you should be testing the contacts. This is something we have not been doing. And then you should be tracing the contacts of the contacts. That's how contact tracing works. Um, and it's probably best done at a local level and not from a call center to actually get the best uptake. Yeah. Um, and you should be looking to support people, whether it's actually working with supermarkets to ensure that people who are isolated can get home deliveries very easily and free of charge. There's all sorts of individual needs which people have. So I think the research done from King's, from uh, Louise Smith and her team, which was published in the BMJ at the end of March, was an excellent survey showing all of the reasons why people do not adhere to, um, to isolation or giving details of the contacts. And, and you should look, we should look at that and learn from it and, and change the system to fit it. Thank you. Stephen, anything to add? Um, yeah, I completely agree. The local approach would be much better with dedicated contact tracers and reverse tracing. I think that's something we've been missing. It means that transmission chains aren't interrupted. If you look at how well Germany did last year, I know they're experiencing a, a huge surge at the moment, then, um, but their testing systems are still excellent. I think I agree, lateral flow should be targeted. Um, there's no point testing populations with very, very low levels. And yeah, it's about the logistics. It, it, our testing capacity and the ability to actually do a PCR is, is incredible, but it, about getting those results through and what they mean, that's the problem. And again, supporting people, absolutely incredibly important. Thank you. Dylan, anything to add? Uh, just just uh, something around actual testing. I, I, I've been really disappointed in the lack of progress in developing better um, uh, near community, near patient, as it were, um, testing using molecular techniques. There was a lot of hype um, uh, uh, earlier on. We all saw the headlines of DNA nudge and this and that and the other, which just haven't gone anywhere. Um, I also know there are some, some real-time molecular testing that is well used around the world for, for instance, tuberculosis, which is quite a complicated thing to, um, to, to test for, um, given the nature of the bug. But, um, but that, that technology has not been transferred 
to um, to COVID nineteen. So I think that has been a uh, would be come to see as a, be seen as a failure of the development of the the life science development progress. Okay. What, what do you mean by molecular testing, Dean? And I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that term. I'm I'm sorry. Molecular testing is as PCR, which which detects the genome mm. of the, the, the bug rather than lateral flow testing, which detects a protein on the surface and is generally less sensitive as Steve, uh, as John has, um, has, has alluded to and, and discussed at length. So it is about, it, in general, these are more sensitive techniques for detecting. And, and that is of course why we're in a fix because of course lateral flow tests, as we've heard, um, uh, and not, not performing nearly as good compared to PCR. But of course, PCR at the moment requires big laboratories and there's therefore a time lag between getting the sample to the laboratory um, and getting results back. I see. So, so what, would, what would we need to do to, to fix that? Is it research in this area specifically? Um, my view is that the diagnostic industry is, um, works at low margins. Um, it's unlike pharma, big pharma. Um, and, and I think therefore the state does have a role in, um, in, in helping to develop um, new technologies. And of course, we're not going to, we, when we come to the end of COVID, we'll probably never get, come to the end, we'll always need to be screening. But in fact, this provides the opportunity to think of how we can more rapidly test and, 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 and survey the population for other infections as they come up, but using tests which actually um, um, are of much higher quality than the mass testing structure we have at the moment. But those rapid, as Dean and you know, the, those rapid PCR tests uh, exist. It's, the, it's just the cost, I think. And I think there is that bigger issue that Dean and highlights, which is how do we build a more sustainable approach to diagnostics within the UK? That's something we don't have. That's something we look to in Germany, actually, where the engagement between academia, uh, industry and public health work really effectively. That's something I think we need to pick up in, in the future. But there are very, very um, effective um, PC, rapid PCR tests that can be used um, um, but, but are very, very expensive. And I think that's the issue, the cost. Thank you, John. I say, I mean, we, we came across some of these in our Cochrane Review, which was published a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so there's the Expert Express and Samba 2 and DNA Nudge. And I think a lot of it is also capacity, that none of those platforms will, that, that they process one sample at a time or maybe in batches of 16 and they take an hour or two hours to do that number. So they have a role in maybe in places like um, care homes or something like that, where that's that's an adequate daily capacity to, to deal with. But for, for mass testing, like we've been talking about, they, they, they won't be actually be able to deliver in their current format. Thank you. And uh, we have one very final quick question from Debbie Abrams. Debbie. Thank you so much, Leila, and, and um, afternoon, everyone. My, my question is, is really around international cooperation and collaboration um, around um, uh, surveillance of emerging variants. Um, I appreciate um, WHO are, are currently consulting on this, um, but what I've been hearing from former colleagues is that it's not as good as it should be. And if we think about the sort of... Uh, uh, what's been said about the uh, highest rates of infections um, that we've seen so far uh, globally. Um, what do we need to ensure that this is um, as optimal as it should be? Anyone? I'm not sure who's best placed to. Well, I, think, I, think, I think this is a this is a real issue. If we're thinking about, for instance, detecting variants, then sequencing capacity around the globe is very, very variable. I understand that it's fewer than 1% of cases in India, for instance, that are being sequenced. And actually some of the collaborative work that has been initiated through the UK COG consortium is now is sadly compromised because of some of the, the funding cuts to the overseas budget has really impacted directly now in real time, actually removing funding from existing projects that were helping to support sequencing in other parts of the world. And I think given the fact that we have that, you know, that, that technology so well developed in the UK, we do have a responsibility to support other countries and that's been compromised, sadly. I mean, I just agree very much with Lawrence there, um, with the ODA, their actual projects specifically to do this that have been cut um, through that. But I mean, it also, 
um, makes us realize that when we talk about the South African variant, the Brazil variant, and so forth, um, this is only because there is sequencing capacity in those countries that have identified it. it does not mean that these originated from South Africa or necessarily Brazil. Um, and, and, you know, we are at this moment in time seeing pretty near the maximum number of global infection rates of infection as has ever been during the pandemic. So these will be being generated all over the world um, and borders are opening and so forth. Um, and, and so I would fully support the concept that really there, you know, surveillance around the world needs to now be for these sort of things, genetic surveillance. Excellent. Thank you. Stephen. Um, just as well, though, we, we also have a responsibility within the UK to maintain surveillance. I mean, if you think about B117, possibly one of the most devastating variants that's actually emerged and it emerged here in the UK. And thankfully, it was spotted. But that's now seeded infections around the globe. So we need surveillance everywhere. It needs to be networked and it needs to be vigilant. Thank you. And John? Nothing more to add. And on that note, uh, and thank you for your patience, we've run slightly over, um, but as predicted, uh, it's been incredibly rich and uh, important. So thank you all for your contributions. Um, you are very welcome to stay. Um, however, if you do go, we shan't be offended. You're very busy and important people. Um, so feel free uh, to uh, do as you wish. But again, thank you so much so to, to John and to Lawrence and to Stephen, thank you so much. Uh, Deanan stays with us um, for the second panel. Uh, and uh, I'm also going to introduce um, Dr. Gabriel Scally, um, who is here with us. He's a visiting professor of public health at the University of Bristol and a member also of Independence Age. And very uh, welcome is Lucy Morton, um, who is the professional officer for the Immigration Services Union, which represents border immigration and customs staff. Uh, in the UK. So uh, welcome to the second panel. We'll aim to run uh, for no more than 45 minutes and thank you in advance for your patience. Let me know um, if having gone over uh, that poses a problem for you at the end. Um, so I'll start uh, perhaps um, with our public health experts, uh, if I may, uh, and then Lucy will we'll come to you afterwards with, with questions specific to your area. Um, but with a similar question to the first question I asked the last panel, um, we heard about, you know, we are expecting that cases are, are going to surge as a result um, of the various restrictions, but specifically on international travel, how worried should we be? We've got currently the list of green, amber and red. Um, how worried should we be about reds and how confident can we be about greens? Gabriel? I'm afraid you're on mute. You summed it up yourself, I think. You know, I, I don't believe in reds and greens. I believe in quarantine or not quarantine. There is no such thing as a half quarantine. You can't do it by half. You either do it properly or don't bother doing it at all, which of course has been the, the UK's position for far, far too long. And uh, we know enough about international to travel to know that, uh, and what happens with travel during this pandemic, that many of the people who are traveling are people traveling back to a country, uh, to their country that they're citizens of. And they very well know how to get to that country by the, um, uh, the most uh, useful route for them. And we don't know necessarily where someone starts their journey. We don't know where they've transited. Uh, we don't know what uh, transport they have used to get to, get to and from particular places. Um, and uh, I think this is a particular problem in a holiday season as we're heading into with uh, people going on holiday to holiday destinations, which will be an international mixing pot almost by definition. So. Uh, whether a country is green or red, to me, uh, as a public health doctor, I, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in uh, managing the isolation of people arriving from abroad at this time. Thank you very much. Deenan. I very little to add to, to, to Gabriel. I mean, uh, uh, I'm, I'm also uh, aware when I see pictures of, um, of Heathrow Airport, um, and uh, despite you know, in in the immigration hall indoors, people queuing for hours and hours, and then going off to their you know amber or red 
you know, quarantine makes a nonsense of things. Thank you very much. Well, on that note, uh, can I pass to Lord Strasburger? Thank you, Chair. Um, Lucy, I've got several questions for you, but of course the other guests are welcome to contribute if they, if they feel they, they have something to offer. Um, can you tell us how many people are entering the UK at the moment? And, um, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> my understanding is uh, about 20,000 a, 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 a day at the moment, the majority of which are hauliers. Right, and, and where they should be complying with quarantine or managed quarantine, have you got any notion of how well that's happening? Uh, little to none, unfortunately. Um, evidence to uh, previous groups and to the Home Affairs Select Committee has suggested that less than 1% of those who are required to isolate at home are checked. Uh, we know from feedback from our members that people who are coming back uh, for home isolation are not always clear that that is different from the lockdown isolation. You can't go out once a day for exercise, for example. Uh, there is better checking at a hotel, uh, but we do already know we've had people who've just left the hotels before the quarantine period has ended. Uh, perhaps you could take us through the, the process of checking people when they arrive, uh, because I don't think we understand that. There are two levels um, with which a border force officer has to check someone who's arrived. So the first is, is the straightforward immigration checks. Is this individual the person who's described in the documents that they hold? Is it the person in the passport? Is the passport intact, unaltered, undamaged? Do they have right of entry into the UK? If they don't, on what basis are they seeking entry and do they qualify for that? Separate to that, we then also have to do, do they have uh, the, pre, the 72 hour pre-departure COVID test? Have they completed their passenger locator form correctly and in full? Uh, have they booked the two tests, the day two and day eight tests that they're required to? And if they're in a hotel or supposed to have been in a hotel, have they booked that? Uh, so that's quite a lot of different bits of paper that are not combined, so it's a lot of separate checks. And presumably you've, you've, you're looking at documentation from all over the world. How, how able are you to verify, for example, proof of a negative test? We're not, is the simple answer. It's predominantly taken on trust. We do get uh, 100 or more a day of fake COVID certificates that we catch. And yeah. the other way we catch them is there's a spelling error in it somewhere. They have to be in one of four languages. It's Border Force officers speak English, thankfully. Um, so if it's in English and there's a spelling error, you've got an outside chance of spotting it. If you happen to speak one of the other specified languages and you can spot a spelling error, then you might see that as well. Otherwise, they're taken at face value. Do you have that bit of paper or email or something on your phone that broadly suggests that you might have taken a test? Uh, there are a series of code numbers uh, and the public health colleagues will, will know more about what they mean than I do, which defines exactly what type of test it is. And the Border Force officer has a list that they can check it against. But these things are very easy to knock up on, on electronically, unfortunately. So if you're catching about 100 a day, can you make an estimate of how many you're not catching? It's inherently unknowable. Uh, we don't know what it is we don't know. Uh, a lot of the border um, and uh, immigration and migration and quarantine controls are based on trust. Uh, we trust people when they say they've not been in a red list country in the last 10 days. We trust people when they say that they're going to go to, to Acacia Avenue uh, to quarantine. Um, we trust both that there is a to Acacia Avenue, that they're going to go there and that when they go there, they're going to stay there. Uh, the, the whole thing is, is all based on an assumption that people will do the right thing. Uh, but I'm not sure that the behavioural mod, uh, mod, the, uh, sorry, the behavioural studies actually indicate that people do. So how confident are you that the, the risky passengers are being weeded out? I'm not certain there's any way to know that. Um, it's already been uh, alluded to, you've flown on a, a plane with lots of other people if you've been in a destination where uh, that in itself has been a, an international mixing ground, you've come through an airport, for example, um, then you've stood in the arrivals hall um, for three or four or five hours. Uh, we know that it's, it's not possible to segregate uh, people from uh, red, amber and green uh, they're going to mix. It's a confined space. Yes, there's air conditioning, but it's still a confined space. Uh, even if we separated that one risky passenger out at some point in that journey, my understanding is that transmission could have occurred at any point. So we're not, we're not truly isolating that risk. 
So you seem to be saying that the very process itself is a bit of a breeding ground for infections. Right now, very much so. Um, when it's so slow and the queues are so bad, then absolutely it's a significant risk both to our members of the Border Force staff that are doing it and to the, uh, the travellers that are standing in, in those queues. And whilst we're required to check 100% of arriving passengers, I'm very happy to, to do that if that's what government directs that we do. Um, the lack of e-gates, the delays, even if a traveller has all their documentation ready to hand and it's all in order, that's, that's going to create a level of queuing on its own. If they haven't complied in some respect, and many haven't, or they haven't got it to order or they've got to go and look for it, that transaction time can shoot up to 30, 40 minutes, an hour per passenger. The knock-on when you've got several thousand people in the immigration hall behind them is inevitable. So it's perfectly possible from an infection point of view that the very process of checking these passengers is a greater risk than not checking them. I don't have the science to know whether it's a greater risk or not, but it must inherently be a risk. If you have someone arriving from a country where you don't have to go into a hotel quarantine, who has managed to catch the virus from someone who does, you may have isolated that individual who's got, who's got to go into the hotel, you found them, you can trace their contacts, but the person who bumped shoulders with them in the airport, who's just vanished off into the wide blue yonder, you've no way of knowing who that is. Right, and there may a lot of people may well have picked up the infection in the immigration hall while waiting. What's, what's the level of delays at the moment? What are the queues like at the moment? Depends on the location, um, but with, on average we're seeing, we're seeing two, three hour delays at the large locations like Heathrow. I'm mindful that the airports themselves count the delays differently. So where they are, are talking about six and seven hour queues, they're talking about from, the get, from when you get off the airport, aircraft to when you leave the airport, whereas Border Force only count the queue that, is, that they can actually see, the queue in the immigration control. So that's why our figures suggest two to four hours and airport figures suggest six to seven hours. But inherently, we can't count what we can't see. So if the queue is beyond the outside edge of the arrivals hall, we're not counting that. And of course, we're not counting how long people are spending in toilets, sitting down and having a cup of coffee and all of those other things that you do as, per, as you move through an airport. And currently, travel volumes are, are still very low, aren't they? Extremely, a fraction of what we'd normally see. And they start to ramp up in the summer. And have you got the extra capacity? No, we do not. And it's not as much an issue of staff. We've got the staff but we can't fully man all the arrivals controls without putting the staff at risk of it from each other. So our own COVID security to keep our staff COVID secure from one another prevents us from manning a full arrivals control. Um, we can't manage it now. Uh, there is absolutely no way that we can manage any increase in demand uh, without there being an associated very significant increase in queues. That's a very troubling picture. Yeah. Thank you very much and thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I've got a, a couple of um, follow-ups. Um, can I just double check, Lucy? So uh, on the on the trust issue, mm -hmm. uh, and much as we'd like to be able to trust absolutely everyone, um, other countries are putting in sort of secondary checks. Um, is not is that not happening at all? Sort of spot checks of one in every thousand, just to deter people from bringing in fraudulent papers, or or is there just not that uh, system in place? We check a hundred percent of arriving passengers that should pick up some of the fraudulent documentation, not by any stretch of the imagination, all of it, uh, but some of it. Uh, there was originally through test and trace uh, a, a telephone check that people had isolated when they got, got to their, their address, um, but that was less than 1%. It then fell to police who were supposed to go and knock on doors and double check. Uh, and again, I think the evidence before the Home Affairs Select Committee uh, the late late last year was that had only happened something like five times in the preceding uh, few months. Home Office does propose to engage a contractor mighty uh, to do these checks but I, I don't know on what basis that contract is under negotiation now so I don't know if they're asking them just to telephone them uh, or if they're actually asking them to, to go visit go see if these people are there. If you phone them up you know are you staying at Two Acacia Avenue? Yes I am. What's all that background noise then? Oh it's the television. There's nothing you can do about that. You, you just, you've got to trust them. And the government today has released its plan for reopening of e-gates, um, yeah. saying it's going to be linked to passports. Um, 
are you happy with the plan as is? Do you have concerns about details in it? Uh, what's your thoughts about the current plan? Being able to reopen the e-gates will make a massive difference to queues. So on that level, yes, I'm very happy. That reduces the risk to staff and the risk from travellers to each other. From the perspective of, uh, is that going to increase or impair COVID security at the border? It's going to impair COVID security. Um, the machine can't check the pre-departure uh, test certificates. It will rely on you having ticked a box on the form that says, yes, I promise faithfully I've done it. We know people aren't complying now. We know we've got fake pre-departure tests now. If all you have to do is tick a box, that's actually going to get worse. Um, but it can check at least that you've completed the form in full, not that it's true or logical or verifiable, but that you've at least put the words in the boxes uh, and that you've booked your tests. Um, you've, you've printed a picture which is not very pretty. If you had a free hand, how would you change it to improve it? I don't have enough science base. Um, and also, to a certain extent, I can watch it from two angles. One as a citizen of the UK wanting to be as COVID secure as possible, uh, but also as the representative of my members who I want to be as safe as possible. So whilst I appreciate the offer, I'm not certain I'm best qualified to give that option. I wonder if our scientists have a view on that. Dr. Scanley, do you have a view? Uh, you're, you're muted, Dr. Scanley. Yeah, I mean, perhaps, perhaps, Dr. Scott, I could ask it a, 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 a slightly more specific way. I mean, from what you've heard from Lucy, can you tell us what are the points of most likely transmission in what she has just described? Well, all the way through, I think. I, I can't see anything, um, anything that is particularly uh, biosecure uh, at all about it, and uh, clearly. I, I, perhaps Lucy may well be able to say, but it, it sounds to me, particularly if we're, we're reopening e-gates, that what we're trying to do is run uh, a system designed for normal times in extraordinary times. Uh, and, and from the queues, without the extra space, uh, without improved ventilation, all of those sort of things that uh, should be taking place if you're, if you're going to do this. But... Uh, uh, my, my preference would be to have a, a properly managed system whereby people booked their arrival in advance. Uh, they sought permission to come uh, in advance. Uh, the documentation was provided in advance and it could be checked in advance so that uh, you would really try and remove as much of that waiting time and uh, the uh, crowding together of people as possible. And you would have the transport available immediately to take them to uh, an isolation facility. Um, that's the sensible way, uh, in my view, to do it. But I, I'm not an expert on, on uh, running um, immigration controls. I, and uh, uh, I, I, I'm very, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very clear that we do need proper, uh, what used to be called port health controls in place. And the port health legislation seems to me to be to, to have been shown to be entirely out of date uh, during the course of this pandemic and urgently needs a review. Thank you. Um, Dean, and I wonder if you could comment or, or go, well, forgive me if, if you might be better placed. We've had a summer of this already. We had a summer where, where people were jumping on flights, going across the world, mixing in halls. Do we have any evidence now from the last time we had this en masse for how much transmission happens during flights and then subsequently in transit? Does that um, exist in the literature? Yeah, uh, there there is some data coming out. I must say, um, you know, what I've heard from Lucy is just extraordinary, um, and 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 uh, and and whilst we're getting a bit fixated on whether we're green, amber, red zones around the world, it seems that by far the biggest risk is just travel full stop, you know, because it is that travel that, that, that you know, whether it's getting on tubes to get to the airport or whatever, getting to the airport and so forth is, is a big risk. What, what has become apparent over the, particularly around the issue of um, the, the spike of infections in India um, is that over the last month, um, a good demonstration that planes coming from India to both Canada and, and Hong Kong have had a number of in, individuals there who are infected. In fact, 
identifying um, likely transmission within aeroplanes by looking at row numbers and proximity of, of individuals. There was um, 47 on one flight, was there not? That's exactly, exactly right. And, and, um, and, and interestingly, um, it, in all of those cases, um, as Lucy identified, the the you know the need for testing before coming on to the get, getting to the airport had been done. You know there was so called documentation around that, um, and so it's very you know the system is very leaky. So both about people who may for fraudulent reasons or just because the tests are not so good or the swabs have not taken have not been adequate. You know come into the aeroplane with negative tests. Um, then the whole risk of transmission within the travel process, um, in, these, in this case, long haul flights. Um, and then, of course, um, those infections being, um, being brought into the country. I should just add that, we, um, that, that uh, BBC had a very good programme last week identifying the outsourcing of the testing of individuals who are then quarantining once they come to the UK. And, and that is an outsourced process, which by all accounts, and listening, there was evidence that that is working very poorly in terms of the ability to get a day two and a day eight test. In many cases, no test kits are arrived and so forth. So that's lowered the confidence, I think, as well about that. And of course, that is being paid for by individuals. Yeah, and Dina, the other thing I wanted to ask you about that Hong Kong case was my understanding is that the vast majority of people in that actually weren't discovered to have COVID until an average of 12 days after they'd landed, which in my head brought into question the whole test and release scheme, but also, you know, day two, day eight. Well, if they're not, you know, have enough of the virus in them to be detected until day 12, um, should we be worried about that? Yeah, it, it, it's very difficult. And, and, and there's not been full, I've not seen the full sort of scientific documentation of that. It's just press reports I've seen. So, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I and I'd take everything, you know, with a with a with a pin, healthy pinch of scepticism um, until I've, I've seen that as to precisely when infection is likely to, to happen. But my conclusion is, is, is both the system is very leaky, but also that they're the process of travel is itself a high risk activity. Thank you. I just want um, to know if, if any of our panelists would say that they're happy to engage in international travel themselves anytime soon. Lucy? It's no. gone very quiet. I, certainly not something that I, as an individual right now, would feel comfortable with. Absolutely not. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't travel internationally. Even shaking his head as well. Um, uh, and on a related uh, matter, Susan Masham, Baroness Masham, with her question. Or is she gone? Um, my Masham. question is, what is the value of a COVID test taken 72 hours before traveling? And the example of the, uh, the case from India to Hong Kong, um, where there was a variant and 27 people got infected. Um, what who is collecting the data it's all very complicated i think it was yeah 47 people but um oh, 47 had been tested before um so it what can we rely on a test taken 72 hours before getting on a plane dinan well i think as uh, as we've said before and lucy identified there are a number of reasons why someone may have a negative test um uh, it may be that they're not infected. It, it may be that the, the, the test has, for whatever reason, not been done adequately. And, and um, all these tests, are, you know, I'm sure many of us have now had the experience of having a swab, uh, a cotton wool swab stuck up our nose and put the back of our throats. It's not a pleasant thing, particularly self swabs are not a, a pleasant thing. So the quality of the, 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 the swab. And then the third thing, which may give a negative test. And the third thing is, um, which I think is probably a very real uh, risk is, um, is fraudulent. So uh, uh, any, any one of us who've had teenagers over the last 15 years will know about ID, ID identity fraud um, in terms of getting to pubs. And from what Lucy has just described, I didn't know this, it, it seems it's relatively easy to, 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 to make up a, a report of a test. Could I just and does, 
does the test does the test work for various ver uh, our variants or or do you need different tests um at this moment in time it is thought that the the the, the tests um, that that are used um, in 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 the UK, for instance, would identify that a molecular test, a PCR test, would identify that. So there's no evidence to date that um, that that these variants would avoid a detection. Um, th th there are some nuances around that, but that's in essence that's the case. But of course, for each variant that comes up, these this needs to be assessed. Thank you. Sorry, Gabriel, you wanted to come in? Well, I was just going to say three days is a long time, I think, in the, the sort of uh, history of this infection anyway. And uh, there's no reason why someone, uh, unless Dina wants to correct me, uh, which he does often, uh, is that uh, I, I, my concern would be that you, it's perfectly possible to be negative three days uh, previously and be, be infectious um, when you travel. What would you suggest would be better? I'm not sure that there is any system of pre-flight testing that would be satisfactory. Um, I, I, I think uh, the issue, of, um, it, it, there is no, I, I think one of the problems is there is no one answer to all of this. It requires a whole string of stuff, which includes uh, biosecure travel facilities where it has to happen, it, it will um, manage isolation where it is needed at the other end. Uh, testing can be part of an overall regime, but as so often in the responses to uh, this pandemic, we've seen uh, a fixation with with the one answer, whether it be lateral flow tests or uh, three three days before. It needs to be an organised pattern, and you can see from uh, from from Lucy Lucy's uh, excellent description of what goes on that this is not an organised, uh, well designed system. And, and we do need system, a systematic approach rather than looking for the one thing that works, because we'll never do, find it. Do you think the countries are working adequately together or could they do better? Uh, inter, well, international cooperation on travel is a very difficult issue. I think it's quite remarkably difficult. Uh, WHO uh, has had a, a fairly liberal uh, position on international travel, which has surprised a very large number of people. The European Union uh, takes a very um, tough attitude from the European Commission, that is, uh, towards international travel, saying that they do not want to see any EU countries um, uh, um, impose restrictions on travel at their borders. Uh, in most recently writing to Ireland because Ireland is, has introduced managing quarantine uh, I, uh, and uh, they have previously written to six countries I, I know of um, complaining about uh, impediments to international travel. They seem to define um, the uh, freedom, the freedom to uh, freedom of movement within the EU to be absolute freedom at any time to move anywhere, uh, which I don't think it was ever uh, meant to be uh, uh, so described. Um, so I, I think there is a, a real problem with international cooperation and, and, and taking a, a view on international travel, which is amazing given the long, the centuries old history we have of quarantine, that we haven't got a quarantine, that we haven't got quarantine arrangements sort of uh, sorted out. And the international travel regulations were reviewed not that long ago, but they clearly will have to be reviewed again and another look at this. Um, because I think it is absolutely correct that anywhere at, around, uh, anywhere in the world, we should have, from on public health grounds, the ability to prevent movement of people, because it's movement of people that generally spreads the infection. So we should be able to introduce quarantine when it's in the interest of saving lives and livelihoods, whether it be a county border, uh, a, a, a state border, or, or a, a countrywide border. Uh, we should be able to um, have the ability on public health grounds to um, restrict travel. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. You're doing such an important job. Thank you, Baroness Masham. Lord Russell. Yes, thank you. Um, th this question is in two parts. The first one is, is for you, Lucy. And if the answer is no, just say no. If you look at other countries, uh, which clearly will have some of the same challenges we do, particularly with airport entry, uh, 
is there anything we can learn from any of them which has any application here or no? Not that I'm aware of, but I'm not um, intimately familiar with the entry routes for every country, I'm afraid. Okay, well, it would appear to me as part of international cooperation, it would be helpful <laughs> if Indeed. everybody knew, because I'm sure there will be pockets of best practice or emerging good practice uh, elsewhere, and it would be jolly helpful if we knew about them sooner rather than later. The second question is to do with the situation in Chile. Um, as we know, Chile has been very successful uh, on the face of it with its vaccination drive, but what lessons can we learn from, from, from what is, is happening there at the moment as we understand it, and what lessons does that have for us here? Gabriel, could I start with you? Yes, uh, well, I think there are four points uh, I'd like to make about, uh, about Chile, a country I, uh, I know and have great interest in. Um, firstly, they have, although they did place uh, quite severe border restrictions, uh, they removed a lot of their border restrictions and they have been, I think, overwhelmed by the spread of the much more uh, highly infectious variant, the, the P1 variant from Brazil, has really caused them enormous problems, not only uh, more infectious, but they also believe probably uh, more uh, aggressive in terms of its clinical effects as well. So firstly, new variants have, uh, uh, have, have really caused them large problems. Secondly, they lifted restrictions in quite an uncontrolled uh, fashion. Uh, thirdly, they have had problems in adherence to mask wearing and social distancing. And I think fourth actually has been their vaccination program. Now their vaccination program has been successful in terms of putting vaccines into people's arms, but uh, it hasn't been successful in terms of producing immunity in the population because uh, the, the latest data from Chile, well, I should say their vaccination program uses two uh, vaccines. Uh, it uses uh, a vaccine called CoronaVac, which is made by Sinopharm, the Chinese uh, manufacturer. Uh, and that forms the vast bulk, over, well over 90% of their vaccine. Uh, and the rest is, I think 7% is Pfizer. And uh, that has uh, been shown, the CoronaVac has been shown to be remarkably ineffective. Uh, only 3% effectiveness with the first dose. And uh, that rises to 54% uh, with the second dose. So they, uh, their, the calculation in the, uh, from uh, probably our colleagues in Chile in the recent paper shows that they expect to have got about 54% of uh, population um, immunity amongst those vaccinated. So if, you've, if, if, if they've only done 40% and they've only got about 50% of those immune, that's only 20% uh, who might have uh, whatever immunity the vaccine gives. So it's, it's probably a, a major problem for them. Uh, it is a, undoubtedly a major problem for them. I think the lessons are obvious in terms of the vaccine efficiency, uh, pre prevention of travel of, uh, to, of uh, movement of variants, um, adherence to social distancing and, and other, uh, other measures and uh, d d getting, if you are going to lift restrictions, doing so in a, in a safe fashion when you have taken the mitigating measures that are needed to keep people safe. Thank you, Gabriel. Dina, anything to add? You just come off mute. Uh, yeah. um, uh, as always, nothing to add to an exemplary answer. Thank you so much for your exemplary answer. Um, Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Leila. Um, I'll direct these at uh, Dr. Gabriel Scally and then others could add in. The, the cases of the Indo Indian variant in the UK have actually been doubling every week for a month, and yet India will only be added to the red list on Friday. With the increased threat of vaccine resistant variants, we all seem to agree that we need to expand quarantine to all travellers. But do you think that should all be in hotels or should we be learning from some of the Asian Pacific countries who are using digital monitoring of people at home? Well, uh, th that's a very good question. And I'm, I'm not going to answer the, the very end bit of it because I'm not sure what is the best mechanism, but I think one of the great failures that there has been during this pandemic is the failure to examine very closely what's being done uh, in other places and put together a package of measures because as I said it is a system and the system that might work for some countries and uh, 
uh, in some communities may not work in all of them, but it does need to be a systematic approach and we haven't taken that systematic approach. I, I think the beginning of your question points out this issue of when would you, when, uh, I, it, it is the, the shutting the stable door after the horse is bolted question, isn't it? Uh, and it is a really difficult one, particularly when you get to variants. And if you think through what we're trying to do, so we're trying to spot variants when they arrive with us, and then we're going to try and stop the importation of those variants. The illogicality of that is ridiculous, uh, particularly given uh, that they're not detected on the, on, on the PCR test uh, at first go. There, there's further analysis needed on those tests, which takes some time to get the answer. And also that that analysis is only carried on, out on a, uh, Dina, correct me, uh, about five to 10%, Dina, would that be right, of, of, of those PCR tests. So for those 77, there could be easily be another, uh, that might be the 10% or the 5% that they've actually found if it's a representative sample of the uh, PCR tests that have been taken. So you can see the problem there. And it, it is this issue about how we continually try to um, play catch up with this. And that's a losing game. This virus moves so fast and changes so fast. And, uh, and you're right about India going on the, on the red um, uh, list. But there's one issue I just want to uh, address. I, have to, I feel I have to address this uh, because I'm from Belfast. And uh, there is the issue of the common travel area, uh, which seems to me to be a, a nonsensical problem, really. But it is a huge problem in that the list of countries uh, uh, adopted for mandatory quarantine by the Irish Republic is different from the UK. Uh, yet, and so someone can go uh, and move uh, across the border between uh, the UK, the land border between the UK and the Republic of Ireland with great facility. That's, there's no, no check at all. So uh, there is a very interesting uh, point there. And, uh, 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 and I think a, a, really, uh, a really highly disturbing issue is that um, there is still disagreement between the administration of Northern Ireland and the Republic about the passage of the passenger information forms that are generated in, in the Republic of Ireland uh, for people who are moving to Northern Ireland and those are not being transferred. And this is despite both administrations having signed a memorandum of cooperation and an, an, under, an understanding uh, almost a year ago uh, now. Uh, and it, so uh, you're, we are, trying to uh, you know, shut the stable door after the horse is bolted, but there was also a, a door out the back as well into the Irish Republic. So uh, it, 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 it just speaks of a, a mess really, and a really uh, incoherent and uncoordinated approach to this whole issue. I mean, that's exactly the same problem we have in Scotland where all travellers arriving are meant to go into hotel quarantine, but obviously most yes. long haul flights at the moment will be through English airports. The UK government refuses to quarantine them there and also doesn't share the data with the Scottish government so we can check that they're quarantining. So yes. it's exactly the same. And I remember meetings with you last summer when we started the talk about zero COVID, that the, you know, there should be work between the UK and Republic so that we could have made the whole common travel area COVID secure and we'd actually all have more freedom now. I mean, we did get close to elimination levels last summer, particularly in Scotland, and then holiday travel helped set off the second wave. So are we not about to make the same mistake again? And particularly if we have this red, amber and green, we're going to be having people launched out of Heathrow into public transport, sitting on a tube for an hour, infecting people around them. I think you're quite correct. And this, it comes down to uh, putting in place a whole bundle of uh, control measures, measures, which are not coherent across the UK, I might add. I, I mean, Professor Deeks, I heard mentioning uh, when I joined about how we weren't testing close contacts. Uh, in fact, Scotland started testing close contacts in February, I think the 18th of February. Northern Ireland started testing close contacts yesterday. Uh, as far as I know, England and Wales still doesn't test the people who are at highest risk. And those are the uh, people who are at highest risk uh, because they've been in close contact with someone who has tested positive. So, 
you, uh, all of these things need to be fixed. Uh, we, we need to fix the international travel and, and movement and the, and the uh, manage, we need a proper managed isolation system for those, but we also need to test people and test close contacts because we're missing people that way. We're, and, and so each, each um, uh, deficiency builds one deficiency upon the other. Someone comes through a porous border uh, without uh, proper controls. Uh, they infect people who are tested. Uh, only a small proportion are um, sequenced, so we get that information lit. And their close contacts, even when their close contacts are identified, uh, they're not tested. They're told to self-isolate. And, and this is a nonsensical way of doing it. I, I should add that uh, the, uh, uh, the set Director General of WHO um, uh, told the world on the 16th of March last year, well over a year ago, test every suspected case. If they test positive, isolate them and find out who they've been in close contact with up to two days before they develop symptoms and test those people too. And we're still not doing that and we're still not protecting ourselves from the importation of the virus. Thanks very much, Dean. And I don't know whether you have anything you feel you want to add that we haven't covered. Not, not really, nothing, and it's outside my specific area, but um, I, I concur completely with Gabriel's uh, uh, views. Okay, can thank I, you can very I just much. just clarify, so just um, on something that Gabriel said that he was deferring to you about the um, likely number of cases of the Indian variant in the UK currently. Did I understand that right? So if we've got 103 cases that we've detected, we actually think it's much, much greater than that 10 to 20 times greater did i understand that correct uh from you know, yes that that's yep. exactly exactly right because there's not been any targeted testing for this these are within the the spectrum of of infections sequence i i i don't know the precise number but i think more recently as infection rates have come down within the uk a greater proportion of those infections are being um, sequence within the, the the COVID genomics consortium. So I think it's probably higher than than that, but it certainly won't be all of those cases. And and as we know, although the numbers remain small, I mean a, a, a PHE um, a document from this morning has identified more than than that. And obviously there's a there's a a big increase, even though we're talking about small numbers. Um, the argument. That, that is used is that, uh, and that Susan Hopkins from PHE um, uh, used um, at the weekend was that most of those cases were likely cases of imported infection rather than ongoing transmission within the UK. But from the discussion we've had um, over the last uh, uh, half an hour or so, it's clear it's very difficult to distinguish between um, whether something, an infection is caught within the UK or imported. So we should be expecting um, a, a, an increase in those infections. Thank you very much. So I have one very final question um, aimed at two sets of people. And I'll, I'll go around all three of you. Um, if you had a key message for people looking to travel internationally this summer, what would it be? And also, if you had Boris Johnson in an elevator for 30 seconds, what would you say to him today? Ah. So I can start with you, Gabriel. Good, good. Well, the answer to your first one is don't. The, the second one, uh, and I, I, in the interests of the health of the population of the world, global health, and the interests of the UK are closely tied to that because of the variants. Uh, I would say, please, please put the UK's voice in favor of getting a, a patent waiver on vaccines so that we can get the world vaccinated because that will make us safe. And that would, would so change the conversation we've just been having, the dispiriting conversation about how to keep out dangerous variants. And the only way to deal with that is to get vaccines ruled out across the world and use the currently unused vaccine manufacturing capacity that there is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deenan? Um, well, with regard to tr travel abroad, my only caveat to, to what Gabriel has said is that, um, you know, we don't want this to be in, in, depending on individuals. Obviously, individuals are what makes up the population, but it is um, 
um, it, it, you know, it, it, the government does have responsibility here to actually give some strong um, guidance and controls over 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 travel. There are many reasons why people travel. It's not just for holidays. Some people haven't seen their family or children in other parts of the world for more than a year. So we need to take that in, into account. And that's why I think we need government guidance there. The, with regard to what I'd see um, if I was in a lift with Boris Johnson, hopefully with a mask on, um, is if he if he could if he had responded to COVID in the in the, with the speed in which he had responded to the U Europe Super League proposals that have come out, then we would be in a much better place. And could he please have a transparent, rapidly rapid decision making process between government and its scientific advisors, so that for the future we can actually be on top of the case rather than behind the curve. Thank you so much. And Lucy? I think my answers are, are going to be of a slightly different nature, I think, but that's perhaps the, the benefit and the glory of these types of panels. If you're going to travel abroad um, during the summer, plan for very long queues on your return, particularly if you've got individuals who are vulnerable. Uh, make certain you've got enough water, make certain your kids have got something to do. If they've got someone, somewhere to sit, there's nowhere to sit in these queues. Uh, so just be aware that that may happen and that you might need to deal with that. Um, what would I say to Mr. Johnson if I was in the lift with him, definitely wearing a mask? Uh, stop giving these days notice of putting countries on the red list. Uh, the impact of saying that India will go on the red list on Friday is that all of the flights, and I think uh, there's 40 odd flights a day from the Indian subcontinent, will be as full as they possibly can be with people who are would have come here anyway in the next few days or weeks or months, uh, but we'll do it in advance to try and avoid the hotel quarantine. The more notice that you give of that change, uh, the more people that will flood in and the virus can't tell the date. It doesn't know, it's not supposed to come in till Friday. Mm. Uh, so that we need to be far faster. The impact on travellers is going to be significant. You'll have gone away thinking it's green, you'll come back thinking it's red. That's one of the, if we're going to take that traffic light system, that's the impact of it. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, so that brings us to the end of um, what has been an incredibly interesting discussion. Uh, Lucy and Dean and, and Gabriel, uh, as ever, thank you so, so much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you to all parliamentarians for their forensic questioning. And as always, thank you to those who are watching at home. Um, I think a lot to think about for our summer plans as a result of this. I know I'm going to go away and reassess uh, some of my <laughs> some of my plans. Um, but thank you all 